Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 14 of Are We There Yet? Love is a Battlefield. I'm your host, Susan Ruth. I'm your host, Mara Edelman, and we are two humans having the real conversations and raising all those questions that we all have about where the there is when it comes to dating, relationships, and sex. And where is your there this week? Oh, my there is, I would, I would, I had a very nice day last week and I got to go to a spa day and hang out all day and just have no responsibilities, nothing. I even like was bad. I kept leaving cups everywhere and I was like, somebody else is going to clean up. But it felt so good. I also felt slightly guilty for the, for the cleaning people. Anyway, it was fabulous. And then I had a chaotic work week that kind of drug me back into chaos, but it's going to be a nice weekend. I've got fun plans with friends and music. And also the universe did what the universe does. We've talked about serendipity and the universe. I had had these questions about somebody I dated that was eating at me a little bit. And then the universe like put this thing in front of me where it all kind of made more sense. And then it just reminded me, like, we can try to be in charge all we want. The universe is fucking in charge and we have to do our pieces. And it gave me hope again, because I lose hope and I start feeling like this is all too hard and uh, dating is hard. And and then being reminded that like the universe has my back, made it all better. Yay. Right? The universe has your back. The universe has. And so everybody out there, the universe has your back. Do the right things. Uh, put yourself in those places. and try even, to- if you do, even if you do the wrong things, the universe yes. has your back, I think. Yeah. Thank you. But yeah. um, the more you try to be a good person and learn to. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's fabulous. Where Where is your there been? What's new with you? Uh, well, my new is that after our episode on sex toys, I thought, well, maybe I should just go get me some. So I went and I got, I'll show it to you, a little show and tell. Mm-hmm. Got a nice little white bag. And it is, remember this? And I've tried it out. It works fantastically. Oh, that's a good one. It's got G-spot hitter. It's got hitter uh-huh. hitter. And uh-huh. it's also flexible. So you can like yeah. maneuver it. It's called um, the Nova by uh we vibe it's a german company silicone it's waterproof so it can go in the shower or the bathroom uh and i also got a uh, cleaner and lube i asked the guy at the sex toy sh- shop and i said oh is this well made because i remember what you said about sometimes they're not made well or they're made in, co- in countries that don't have strict adherences to uh to you know the chemicals being used and the products being used and he said oh no they're being they're made in Germany, so it's a it's a solid project, uh, the solid product, and uh, and it works great. I already I love it. it. And does the does the clitoral part have a lot of pressure, like stimulation? Yes. Yeah, it's that great. Does. Yeah, I really I it doesn't. I'm gonna have to change my rabbit in for that one. I think. Yeah. Well, you know, you gotta still you gotta switch things up a bit. You gotta. I still have my other one, which I'll show. This is oh, this is remember. Oh wait, I don't think I did tell you. So I have this. This is my, my tried and true little baby, uh-huh. but my original that I've had forever. The one that you said makes a lot I of know this is in the sex toys episode, but I just had to show it cause I didn't show it last week. When you turn it on, it sounds like <laughs> it's so old. So turn you're turning on. on. Oh yeah. Off. I had to hit it a couple of times. <laughs> there it goes. I, I hit it a couple of times and then it gets cold. Oh, you must be so happy with your new rabbit. You're like, this is like the way well, it's a big difference. Like I'm blushing because I'm so I'm like and the little ones are great to take on your purse on vacation, car rides, whatever. Yeah. Although if I took that the old school one on a trip and it suddenly went off, people would probably arrest me for being a terrorist or something. They're like, what is that noise? That is so awesome. And also, Blondie today. What's up with the Blondie? Yeah, you look yeah, it's, good. Thank you. It's it's one of my wigs. I just you know I enjoy playing around with the good kind of the little wig action happening. Um, it's funny because this is a black and white show, so it may not really look any different. So I don't know if I'll be able to like for a second put it on color so you can see, and then back to black and white, but. Super cute. It's a blonde curly haired wig sorts of situation. So we're both into it. it. So today we're talking about communication and conflict, which isn't the funnest topic, but hopefully, yeah, by the time we're done, hopefully everybody can figure out where they have some room for improvement 
um, maybe look back at some past experiences and understand it better. Um, and so we're going to talk a lot about the Gottmans. I love them. They are the cutest thing ever. They're this older, maybe 70s Jewish couple who have been together for like three decades. And so 45 years ago, John Gottman, who's a psychologist and his guy friend, he called it his bro, this is the bromance part of it. We're trying to date and realizing that they were horrible at it and that they didn't understand love and they were psychologists. And so they started the Love Lab, which essentially is a research area. Uh, there's also the Gottman Institute now, but the Love Lab was like a, a rooms that are videotaped. They bring couples in, have them do questionnaires, have them figure out like where they could communicate better. They hooked them up to machines, monitored their heart rates, and they interviewed thousands of couples, um, some of them over 20 years, which is super cool to follow people like that. Wow, that's cool. I know, right? Like 20 years later, how are you doing? But they can actually predict whether people will still be together in 20 years based on some of the stuff we're going to talk about today with like a 90% accuracy. It gives me goosebumps. So essentially, they use this love lab to come up with parameters that say, you do these things, you're going to get divorced. Or, or if you're not, I don't necessarily. I'm going to make a guess on what one of them is. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me. I roll. Oh, 100%. That falls into the, it falls into a lot of categories, but it's super critical to eye roll somebody, right? Not okay. I feel like um, they, yes. So they um, came up with it 90% predictive based on a bunch of these things. And wow. so, I know it's pretty crazy. So they also found, like you would think, okay, if your relationship's 50% good and 50% positive versus 50% bad, that might work. And they found that that is not true, that it's actually a five to one ratio. You need to be having five positive um, interactions with people um, where there's fondness and respect and good stuff to the one bad, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, all the bad ones. And so if you're, if you're feeling out of balance in your relationship, and I don't necessarily believe in marriage, so we're just going to talk about all relationships, but whether there's going to be a sustainable relationship or not are based on all of these things. And so the biggest part is the four horsemen, which we'll get into in a minute. And that's all the negative stuff. The other pieces are the bid for affection, which I call, I like to call the reach and response. I've, I've actually heard this concept a lot over time. Did you say beg or big? Oh, bid. Like bid. a, a okay. bid. Like I'm, I would like a bid of a, uh, for affection or a bid for your um, attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got and it. And whether that other partner responds to that bid in an appropriate manner. Um, we were laughing because I sighed earlier and you had caught that. That's actually an appropriate response. Because if your partner's sitting there as somebody that you're in, and again, this isn't necessarily just people you date. This can be friends. This can be coworkers. All of these interactions are with everybody, but we're focusing on relationships, of course. So essentially a bid for affection could be, you're sitting on the couch and your partner's had a long day. And they, <sighs> if you totally ignore that, you're not really responding to them, right? And that's a bid. The sigh is a bid. The sigh is a bid. I like to call it the reach and response. That was a reach. And maybe subconsciously that's a reach. I went camping with friends and I could tell that they weren't doing very well when one of them, she goes, he goes, hey, babe, come give me a kiss when you're done with that. And she kind of blew him off and then never came back around and gave him the kiss. And I watched the whole thing happen. It's the, I know it makes me so sad. It's like the reach and response cycle. Uh, somebody leaves you a voice message and you never get a response. It's, to me, it's with everybody. It drives me crazy. It's actually one of my biggest triggers. Back, back to the texting someone and then you don't hear back from them and you're like, oh, it me crazy. It doesn't have to be in the moment. It doesn't have to be the same day even. It's like work emails, same thing. I get highly annoyed. It's one of my biggest triggers. If there's a reach, at some point, there needs to be a response, right? They call it the bid for attention. And that if, if that's not happening, probably doomed. The other big one is um, there was the, the bid for affection, not doing the four horsemen. And I'm totally blanking. Why am I blanking? Give me one sec. And the four horsemen, do we want to say what those are yet? Oh, yeah, sure. The, um, we've got criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. And we're going to go all into all of those deeper. But essentially, it's all the negative stuff, the ways we shouldn't communicate. And so if you're responding to your partner's bid and you're not doing those things, 
There was a third one. I'm sorry, I'm blanking, guys. Hold on. Reach and response. Don't do the four horsemen. It'll come to me in a minute. But yeah. essentially, they said that they put people into either categories of you're being a master or you guys are disasters. <laughs> it's a little hardcore. <laughs> it's hardcore. So, but essentially, masters 86% of the time don't do the bad things and always respond to their partners. 33% of disasters. They only, the disasters only respond 33% of the time. Of course, it's not going to go well. That's not good. And the coolest part, so then he's got the love lab. They figure out all this stuff. 10 years into the love lab, he meets Julie, who's a psychoanalyst. And they've been married ever since for like three decades. And we have worked together on all of this stuff. And they do lectures and they've written a million books. They're adorable. I so, have put out a sticker, the white sticker with the black writing that says God and then their names. Scott, uh, Scott I, I haven't seen it. Yeah, is it a door? Oh, I'm saying they should have one. Oh, Gottman's. I, yeah, got Gottman's. I keep kicking my table. Uh, also, apologies for anyone watching. The it's really warm today, and so the windows are open, and that's just the way it is. <laughs> that's a, well, I have a question on the bid for uh, bid for attention thing. What happens then in a relationship where somebody? I think, I don't want to say overdoes the bid, but it's constantly like, <sighs> or constantly like, you're not doing, you know what I mean? That sort of mm -hmm. constant <sighs> seeking attention, seeking attention. Actually, because that could be exhausting for the partner. Um, I wonder if they delve into that because I think that we all have those responses, but I think also in some relationships, people take that too far. I would 100% agree with that. I didn't hear that from them, but my assumption would be that then that has to be a conversation where you're like, you know, I want to be able to respond to you. That 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 goes back into that space thing we've talked about. Yeah. Working out boundaries around how much together, how much space, how much attention you can really give to somebody and still have a full balanced life. Yeah. So that would just be a conversation. They, I, they did not go into that, um, but I will someday try to find the answer. But my answer to that is, Make sure you've had conversations about um, balance and space and togetherness, right? Yeah. yeah. So the four horsemen, um, let me just make sure I'm not missing a piece. Yeah, no. So the four horsemen, criticism, um, that harsh complaining thing, like you never, you always, um, it always conveys blame. Um, it doesn't leave any room for seeing the positive about what the person did possibly do, right? which everybody's always trying to do their best, right? Yeah, uh, but always and never are deadly words in relationships. 100%. And uh, saying I think something is also pretty risky. But when you say I feel like this is yes. going on, it's a, it's a softer way to get in there and have the conversation. The I feels are always the better way to go around those things. And then my favorite quote from Harville Hendricks, he's an author that wrote uh, Getting the Love You Want. If you want to always be right, then you can't be loving. <laughs> so like, yeah, you can't always be right. And so if you're criticizing somebody constantly, you need to look at the dynamic because people can't always be wrong and you can't always be right. It doesn't work that way. There's always somewhere in the middle of something, right? Somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And so I mean, um, the word always seven times since we said don't ever use always or never. <laughs> oh, I am not good at it. Hey, not as we do, people. <laughs> yeah, I never said I was great at not using these words. I'm just doing my best to try to do better. Um, people often use it when they're overwhelmed um, and get more critical when uh, they're having a conflict with somebody, obviously. And the best thing for people to do for solutions is like leave the uh, leave room for seeing that the positive side, right? Like that people are trying to do their best, that they're coming from a good place, use the I feel statements. Solutions could also be like, remember you're a team. Like if you're constantly criticizing somebody, you are no longer putting yourself into the team team category. Mm -hmm. And um, the other good one is yes and instead of yes, but I've been really working on that one. So I hear you, yes and versus yes, but, but, Right, that just it then that is a defensive. It's a yeah, but you did this. Yeah, but you did that. That's that's not healthy. That either. kind of tit for tat piece, which then takes away the teamwork part, right? 
And then also, if you're constantly repeating yourself, that's a sign that maybe you're being critical. So that nagging, criticizing kind of, if you're said something 10 times to somebody and they're not changing it, well, then there needs, you need to figure out how to change yourself because they're obviously not going to change it. Also, I would offer up that if a criticism is being offered uh, a few times in that to ask what the fear is behind the criticism, what are you afraid of that you keep criticizing me about this situation? Right. Like if you think I'm eating too many cookies, was it because you're afraid that I will die <laughs> of a heart, heart attack? attack? Heart attack from all the cookies? <laughs> yeah. Or if you think I'm doing, uh, I'm hanging out too much with the guys, is it because you fear that they'll somehow take you away from, you know, be take you away? From? So I think that we have to also look at the fear patterns behind the reasoning of why yeah. we're using particular words. Very true statement. And people's fear is usually what gets in the way. And then, of course, yes. And then our next one is defensiveness. So as soon as somebody criticizes, what happens? Yeah. Here comes the defensiveness. Um, I tend, uh, out of all of them, I tend to get more offensive than anything else that I do. And I tend to be defensive. 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 I tend to get defensive easily. And I think I'm over sensitive to criticism when even sometimes it's not. You and I had that interaction one time Mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, I'm getting really defensive. Mm -hmm. I think we decided we were going to use the, we're not going to debate things. We're going to have dialogue about things, right? Like, uh, because I can get fairly defensive sometimes. Right. When that, that is, that's a behavior trait too. If you say to someone, Hey, what about this? And, and they hear it as you don't like what I like, and therefore I am going to feel wrong. Right now. Yeah. And somehow you think I'm wrong when the other person is just saying, Hey, what do you think about that instead? Yeah. That, I think that's not uncommon in relationships and again, at work and friendships, things like that across the board, but I feel, so that's when I, when I did all of this, that's the one that I'm definitely going to keep working on. So defensiveness is that, um, response to criticism where you feel unjustly accused, you start fishing for excuses, like, but, but I did all these other things. Um, you play the innocent victim. Like, I don't know why I I never do anything wrong and Mm -hmm. it's never successful. It just lets your partner know that you're not taking their concerns crit- seriously, right? Because if they're criticizing, they have some kind of concern. And now you're coming back and being defensive and all you, you end up in this stupid cycle of doom. And so if the person can be a little less critical and, and do it in a, in a nicer way, and then the solution for the defensive part is accept what that person's saying, really try to see their perspective, and apologize if you were wrong. And that's hard for some people. Some people have a really hard time apologizing. Sure. Yeah, right? Yeah, that makes them feel weaker or, yeah, or somehow yeah. They're losing the upper hand. Family, relationships that keep score. Oh, bad. That's danger, danger zone. Danger zone. Someday we'll do a whole thing on like how to not do that game. Uh, you just reminded, well, I had been thinking about this couple that I inter- encountered when I was thinking about the cycle of criticism, defensiveness, oftentimes this is horrible, but oftentimes if I end up somewhere and a couple sits down next to me, I groan internally. I know that's horrible, but 90% of the time I get to watch all these horrible interactions and it ruins the fun I'm trying to have. <laughs> I love watching people interact. I think it's so fascinating. I do, but 90% of the time you can tell, it's just, it. This is a perfect example, although it turned out great at the end. So I'm sitting at this outdoor restaurant. I've got the dogs with me. This couple sits down at this shared picnic table. Can we sit here? Of course. Very quickly, the husband accidentally spills her drink that they just got from the bar. And then ice is going everywhere and drinks are going everywhere. And he's like, I thought you did it. I thought you did. They're fighting over who spilt it. And then they're looking at each other and getting all pissed off. A criticism, defensive, criticism, defensive. And I'm watching it as the water's dripping on their legs. It goes on for like, I felt like five minutes, but it was probably only one. And, and I go- a waste of time and energy. I, 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 I was like, would you guys like some napkins? <laughs> Solution based. And then they both calmed down. They'd been together 11 years. They seem, they seem great, but it was that interaction that you watch couples do that I'm always like, I, why is this so hard? I always think it would be interesting if you could- watch almost like a as if you were watching a foreign film and you're watching people interact and 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 how they talk to each other and what is really being said 
-hmm. in their minds. Mm -hmm. the, the, the thing that they're actually feeling or saying that goes by underneath that would make life a whole lot easier. That would be super cool. Mm -hmm. But essentially it's kind of what the love lab did because between watching, they have a bunch of researchers sitting back watching people's body behavior their and their heart rates and really realizing that they may be acting this way, but that's not what's actually happening, right? And, oh, I remember, sorry, wow, brain dead today. So their other thing is the rip and repair cycle. So you've got the bid for connection or reach and respond. You've got don't use these four horsemen. And then you've got the rip and repair, which we'll go more to in a little bit. But essentially, you can't always be perfect. These things are going to happen. But when they do, how do you repair well? And if you can't repair well, then obviously, once again, they're like, well, we can predict you're 90% sure not going to make it. <laughs> How do you prepare well and not keep carrying all the damaged goods along the way? So that if you're, you and I are in some fight about something that I then dig through my little surplus of memory and be like, oh, you did this that day. And do you remember when you did this, that you'll, that is death death to relationships it is the death to a relationship and unfortunately i see a couple that's what I, some a couple, happens a lot yeah a couple of clients i've worked with friends that i know and so my answer to that is be in constant communication i'd like it to look this way i didn't feel great about this you can't let it build up underneath it's gonna come out it's gonna explode i had a boyfriend once i may have talked about this before on the show i had a boyfriend once that when uh, every couple of weeks we had reviews, like as if it was a job and we would sit down and we would say, how do you feel about how was our communication the last few weeks? How was our, and it, we did that for the first year or so of our relationship. And then I don't think we needed them as often. We did still do them, but just not as often. And, you know, how is our intimacy? How is our communication? How do we feel about our interaction with friends and family? It was very helpful. I thought it's fucking brilliant. I had actually thought about it. Someday we're going to review that book, The Eight Dates, which talks about how you move slowly into dating. But that's what it does is it builds up that communication thing so that I've thought about that too. I want a once a week quick check in. You and I do that whenever we get ready for these. I like it that we do that. How are we? How's everything business and personally? And I think if more people do that, you're not going to have all that underneath baggage. Yeah, it, it definitely works things out before they become mountains. So stonewalling is next. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, contempt. Well, so. Oh, contempt. Uh, well, and everything you just said, don't let it build up underneath so that you don't get to the contempt phase. Contempt is ugly. Contempt is that like, instead of criticism, which is like attacking somebody's personality, contempt is like, I am better than you. I can do these things you cannot. You're trying to bring somebody down a peg, um, huffing, eye rolling, contemptuous behavior, put downs, mockery. It's ugly, right? Like it makes me feel sick to, like I would never be in a relationship if somebody was, if there was that level of contempt. I've seen it in people. And I think I'm not sure how much longer they're going to last. <laughs> it's like sad. My parents um, have lasted decades. <laughs> I, Actually, I look back, yeah, my parents have were pretty contemptuous at times also. I think it is something that happens to people when they've been together a really long time. But my goal is when I fall madly in love, I don't want to end up here, right? And so the more you learn these things and the more you put them in place, then hopefully you don't end up contemptuous someday because it, they've done studies that actually causes psychological damage to your partner, which is that flooding of emotions, stress hormones, like... That is not a healthy relationship. A lot of people are raised as that is love, right? A lot of people are raised in environments where that equals love. And so that is certainly a cycle to uh, that's a little more tricky maybe to break for a lot of people. You hit the nail on the head because part of what it said was essentially then you put up a wall between you and your partner. But some people want that wall because being too close is hard and they only learned how to be contemptuous when they were younger. Yeah. I think about that idea, you know, you said, I want to be madly in love. And I think, ah, oh, see, look at how we even adjective uh, or adverb uh, uh, the action. Right. I want to be mad. No, I want to be calmly in love. I want to be happy. Thank you. That's. But is that just you? We all do it, right? We all do it about all sorts of things, you know, guilty pleasure and madly in love and these weird oppositions that 
it's almost like it's almost like we set ourselves up for failure when we do stuff like that we want to be happily and peacefully peacefully in love grounded in love grounded in love yes supported, supported in love you know uh equals in love which well, i mean honestly i don't know if anyone is ever equally in love i imagine in any relationship one person at any given time is more in than the other and that they switch you know that's just the nature of humans maybe I think so. But again, if you're, once you get to this contempt, it's almost like that death knell in, in the relationship. Like, and then what happens? So after that, oh, solutions to it. So solutions to contempt um, slow is to kind of slow down your breathing, try to figure out where it's coming from so that you cannot act that way, figure out what you're feeling, why you're feeling it, have the conversation before it gets to that point and um, try not to get to the stonewalling because once you're at stonewalling, you're kind of done because the reason they call it that is you have a stone wall up in between the two of you, right? My, now, mother, my yeah. mother used to say, if you're going to fight with your partner, start taking off your clothes. By the time you're naked, they'll have forgotten what the argument is about, or they'll realize how silly the argument is. And I know that that doesn't work in every situation, but I have employed it. And it certainly works in the dumber arguments. I like it. Oh, that's a good one. Just start stripping. Well, my favorite when we what well, we're going to talk about the rip and repair cycle later is when people start getting flooded and too emotional. Esther Perel's favorite thing is like touch each other, lay down on the floor, side by side, touch each other because it calms that flooding um, cortisol heart rate up. Can't think clearly. Peace, right? And so taking clothes off and getting naked and getting all sexy for the smaller arguments. Yeah, not for the big ones, but for dumb stuff like why did you park there? Yeah. <laughs> Which is right. like a weird argument. Oh, no. yeah. 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 Oh, it's funny. So we don't want to get to stonewalling because essentially now we're looking at like partners are avoiding each other. You don't want to talk about things. You're distancing from each other. Um, it usually happens when people are feeling really flooded. And so that feeling of like seeing red, heart rate up, sick to your stomach, cortisol, fight, flight, or freeze, I feel like I need to run, is like what happens to people. And they've done studies that most, most commonly people that tend to go straight to stonewalling are people that were born in male bodies or, or male, male bodied people. And whether that's because they weren't taught to learn to feel things, communicate their feelings. But a lot of times when these things come up, they get physio physiologically flooded and have to move That's away. Huh? Testosterone bursts. Probably. probably, and cortisol for sure. And then they have to kind of move away from it all. Um, but what that does to the other person, now this person has to go run away and stonewall, is the partner feels like, wow, um, totally alone. My partner doesn't even want to cooperate, doesn't even want to communicate. And that's a horrible feeling. Yeah, it's interesting too that I think sometimes fights get to the point where you need to run away. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this before that on How I Met Your Mother when Lily and Marshall would fight and they would say pause. Yes. And things were just getting so out of control and maybe they, you know, they were escalating to a point where there was a no return. They had the wherewithal to say pause and then everything would stop. They would do something touch or go eat or connect somehow they're hilarious they're like pause they're great. and i know it's a sick oh, we're gonna eat lobster <laughs> yeah yeah and it's great but it's such a good reminder that um that sometimes things do get to a point where you are making sense or you are being maybe crueler than you intended to be or you are picking through the past and in those cases it's much safer for everyone to say we need a timeout and I, I think I talked about this in one of the earlier episodes. I watched an interview with a couple, uh, the male and the couple is autistic and they had worked out a really lovely system. And I think this would work for somebody in a partnership there where there wasn't an autistic person is that uh, when they do feel that point coming on before they reach that point, they, they have a almost like a safe word, you know, it says. Yeah time out or pause or whatever it is pause is good because it says you're coming back to it i like the word pause yes. and with the agreement and this is stuff that needs to be worked out beforehand not in the moment of the fight no. but with the agreement that um if i use that code word that says i'm going to lose my shit in five minutes or whatever it is that 
with the understanding that I too, out of respect for the relationship, will also come back and say, I'm ready now yeah. and not, not just vanish forever. Or- I still think it's a good idea to give kind of, I feel like I need an hour. They've actually done studies that 20 minutes is a good amount of time usually for that physiological response to kind of calm down. But some people might need longer. Some people might need shorter, but some kind of idea of like, give me an hour, mm-hmm. I'll be back and we'll finish this conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I also, Yeah, I, I think that's great. Also, something that I work with people on is understanding like where you're at, like between one to six, six is like explode. One is like, I feel calm. I actually do it sometimes in my days where I'm like, where am I? Okay, it's time to calm back down. That's a natural. Yeah, your parasympathetic system, it lowers your cortisol levels, slows your heart rate. And so for people to be aware of where they are, like don't just get to six and scream pause. Hey, you know what? I'm feeling a little um, revved up by this. I think I'm gonna need a pause in a minute. Let's continue, but like a little, you know, does that make sense? Almost like a pre-warning. Absolutely. Like, and respect your partner's need for that pause so that you don't hold that against them either. Yes. I mean, everything is a negotiation. Every relationship Every is a negotiation. So do you want Thai food? food? No, I want Italian. Well, then you decide how much do I want Thai food compared to how much they want Italian. And it's a negotiation. The whole thing is a- it's the same kind of food. It's a saucy yeah. noodle. We're good. You know, well, it's all saucy and it's all very spicy. As long as it's spicy, I'm a happy girl. Okay. So yes, the thing that comes up a lot with stone stonewalling is that fight, flight, or freeze. And people that stonewall need to fly to, I tend to fly flight, tend to flee. They tend to flee. They're all good. I, I'll take, I'll accept all of those freeze, answers. Freeze. Um, I have never been a freezer, but I'm definitely a fighter. And so it's hard for me when I date people who go straight to stonewalling. And unfortunately, as the studies show, a lot of men go straight to stonewalling because it's too much. It floods them. And so I've gotten better as an older person to say, okay, go take that time. Um, I hate it when they, again, reach and respond. When they don't come back and respond to that, we're going to finish this whole thing. Um, But ways to work on that um, is... Ah, uh, totally blanky again. Uh, on the stonewalling? Yeah. Oh, the thing, sorry. The things we already talked about. Yeah. Call a pause. That's why it wasn't coming to me. We'd already talked about it. We already talked about it. Yeah. yeah. The call a pause. Um, take the time, breathe, touch each other, come back, um, pull each other back together, have the conversation. Um, my favorite thing, I got this from Navy SEALs. Um, Let's work the problem. Hmm. So in the Navy SEALs, you know, they're out. This might, was my, one of my favorite TV shows. They'd be out there shooting people, you know, and it, there, so something would happen. We need to work the problem. To me, that is great in relationships too, because all you have to do is figure out what each person needs, come back together, work the problem. The faster, the better and to get back to the fun part, right? I, Sex and Thai food, right? Come on. I tried one thing once in a fight with a partner and it really worked out well. We, we, I know it requires sort of, um, you just have to go with it. Basically lie down on the ground or on the floor or on the carpet or whatever, and your feet are touching, but you can't see each other. Your eyes are closed mm-hmm. and you're just, you know, you're, you're talking mm-hmm. stuff. Really? But by keeping your eyes closed and by sort of cal- that calming stance and, but t- touching the feet. I like that because then you can do a little pressure. You t- t- Yeah. Get- and it really, it works. It's like immediately gets you in a different vibe because you're, you're not seeing the person do stuff. You're not, you know, picking up on micro movements or anything like that. You're really left to almost your intellectual brain that's away from the emotional brain. Yes. So I recommend that if you want to try it because it works for me. Oh. I love Anybody that. Anybody on the floor when things go well. <laughs> yeah, on the floor, put your feet together. I think that goes back to that whole part about they've done studies that men do better communicating side by side. It's why that you do better having the conversation in a car. Oh, on, interesting. On a walk. Um, because for them, it is a lot. They get flooded easier. They've done this. You know, it's easier for them to feel flooded and overwhelmed trying to understand this like cornucopia of emotions. Um, and again, this is generalizing, but as women, we I love it. feel and do like a hundred million emotions. I was listening to this podcast and she was joking. She goes, no, my husband very quickly told me my only emotions are hungry, angry, sleepy. <laughs> and she had to work. 
she had to work, she had to work with him on understanding the other emotions that he was feeling right that's hilarious oh oh wait she was saying that he had those so that that he goes don't expect me to feel all those other things i only feel hungry sleepy horny yeah like the and that it i'm again generalizing but i think women feel a cornucopia of 100 million things every two seconds and for men, it's a little simpler. And or they know how to acknowledge what those things are, at least. The men may be feeling that, but don't have a language for it or, or something to, to yeah. hang a hat on. That. They don't always understand what they're feeling. And then as women, we're like, why don't you know what you're feeling? This is, at least I can, I can be this person. I don't know why you don't understand why. Like, can't you just tell me how you're feeling? Because I know how I'm feeling. Why don't you know how you're feeling? Not the, de- the joke death knell for a guy when he hears his partner say, what are you thinking? Yeah. Yeah. Or do you want to, can we talk about it? Both, both those things. So all those things are the solutions we talked about. Pause. I like the feet together. That's freaking amazing. So those are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So let's uh, rehash them real quick. Criticism. I don't, um, I always never, you're verbally attacking, um, ways to fix it. You can try the gentle startup. I feel uh, that always is helpful. Um, and then you've got the defensiveness that comes with the criticism. So victimizing. Um, I, I, all, I don't do that, getting all defensive. And really what you want to do is hear where your partner's coming from, try to accept the responsibility, apologize if there's something to apologize for. Because if not, it's going to lead to the contempt, which is attacking the person and being nasty. And that part is where things I've seen people do that. And it's not pretty. Uh, Remind yourself you're a team that you really want to stay a team. And if you want to stay a team, you better figure out how to not be there because then you're going to get to the stone wall where essentially nobody's talking about anything. You're withdrawing from each other. And the best way to do that is to do the pause, come back when you feel better, have the conversations. Yeah. I also think that it's helpful to, especially for people that may not be great communicators or be great at touching their own feelings, to say things like, do you feel you're more this or more this, but gently, not you're being this or you're being that, but more like, do you feel this or do you feel this? And give a couple options. It's almost like the pain chart. Yes. Where are you on this chart? Yes. I use the one to six scale with my clients and patients, but like, I think it's 10 for pain. Yeah. The 10 pain scale is 10, but like, yeah. Where are you falling? Yeah. Where are you feeling right now? And some people might get annoyed by that, but I think again, it's a compromise. You have to find that, that flow between two people. Yeah. It's hard. It's so Mm -hmm. hard, but when it's not going well, so now we're going to talk about the ways that uh, people can repair because if you don't repair, so you, I've seen couples do this. They've gotten to all the four horsemen. I have a couple going through some of that now. And then they're now having to repair. So it's almost like you build a house together, then you rip the fucking house down. And then you have to start repairing the house. And all of life is maintenance. And that's the annoying part about life, right? But the goal would be you build the house or the castle and, and then maybe you tear it down at time. But you don't ever tear it all the way to the studs again. That's you have the to make sure the house is built on a strong foundation as well. Yes, yes. Which kind of goes back to that beginning part about like in the very beginning of that learning how to, if somebody's giving a bid for attention or reaching, respond, reach, respond, reach, respond, build it up well, build a good foundation. Don't allow the four horsemen to tear it down. And if they do, here's some ways where you can rip and repair. Hopefully you don't rip too far, but essentially don't catastrophize. Don't catastrophize. I cannot say that. Catastrophize? Uh, yeah, sounds right. Sure. It's wrong to me. Don't catastrophize things. Just because you have a fight does not mean your relationship is over. Just because you're fighting doesn't mean something's wrong. Actually, if you're fighting well, the I feels and the coming back to communicate well, it's actually good for a relationship to have that go on. Uh, take a break. We already talked about that. And um, fighting happens because people want to feel heard and validated. You did a really good job earlier validating me when I was like, I'm feeling overwhelmed. How do we schedule things better? And you were like, I hear you. You did such a good job of that. And so for people to remember, if there's any kind of discourse, it's usually because somebody's trying to feel heard, respected, um, wanting to have the conversations about it. Um, Don't be afraid to apologize. Um, You know, people get angry and slam doors and 
cuss at each other. It's better if you don't, but those things happen. And so essentially, you know, um, if things happen where you felt out of control, coming back and apologizing for that is really important. I think it's great to say yeah. to someone, hey, this is what I'm hearing you say. Is this correct? Are you yes. feeling this way? This is what I'm hearing. I might be hearing this wrong, you know, which is sort of a nice little dancing, stick your toe into the fire to see how warm it is, you know, kind of thing. Yes, yes. instead of jumping straight into the fucking fire. <laughs> I tend to jump straight into the fire sometimes, but or I like- assuming what somebody means or feels because it may be being lost in, tr in translation. The telephone game of relationships is, is a slippery slope, you know? I like that one. I feel like I should have done that um, with that last person I was dating because there was a couple of times where I shared stuff. I'd like this. I'm not sure if he understood or received it the same way. I should have asked, okay, what did you just hear? Like, is that making sense? Are we on the same page? And I forgot that step. And then I think we weren't on the same page, but I assumed we were because I had the conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's good to have somebody repeat back what you've said yeah. in, in, in their understanding, repeat it back as they understand yes. it. As they understood and it. to be patient if they don't understand to be patient until they, they are hearing what your feelings are that yeah. all of that and then remember that it's an opportunity to grow so fighting in relationships is not always a bad thing because essentially people that don't fight or totally stagnate like we just talked about they have all this stuff underneath so if we're using the house analogy their basement is dirty nasty full of rats and ugly and it's all going to explode one day and so arguing dead bodies a oh, dead bodies down there. Yeah, there's skeletons, there's dead bodies. That's gross. I don't want to think about it. Yeah. So essentially try not to get there, but if you have to make sure you're repairing and yeah, we took a couple quizzes. Those were fun. I got to find my responses. Really quick too, this just popped in my head is maybe a good idea. I've never employed this, so I don't know if it would work, but as a couple, when you're in a good space, maybe in like uh, put in a basket a bunch of ideas of fun things you like to do together put them on a little piece of paper one at a time throw them in the basket and as a reward of working out a disagreement or coming to a really good place after a fight or, or whatever that you both together go to the basket and reward yourselves for great yeah. and give, even if it's just going to get coffee together doing a crossword going to get ice cream going to chat food <laughs> should be mine you know whatever it is yeah. that that you know, that will start to train your brain to really want that that healthy yeah. feeling it's a, you okay. know we work on reward systems we're just yeah. nervous, you know i was about to say because then every time you do it well you get a positive reward so it's going to put you wanting to do it well. I also was listening to this interesting podcast. It was essentially like if you're dating somebody and they are not responding how you want them to respond, instead of freaking out, trying to have the conversation, remove your attention. Because this is such a true statement. Even negative attention is attention. And for some people, that negative attention is still fueling them. And if you want a better response, instead of doing that criticism, nag, 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 criticism, nag, 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 remove your presence. I find it with my animals. If they're not cooperating and I give them negative attention, they still are, they, they act up more, right? Because they're still getting attention. Either I change it to positive and or remove the, myself from it altogether. Now it's a better interaction. And I personally get into fight mode and do that whole protest behavior that we talked about on the last episode in attachment styles where um, you aren't hearing me, you aren't cooperating. And my protest is like, uh, let me send you a five page email and tell me why you should, which I'm never gonna do again after understanding this stuff better because sure, I'd like that person to understand where I'm coming from. We've all sent the email, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're turning pink. You yeah. too have sent I've, the I've sent the email too. <laughs> all right, yeah, yeah, in my desperation of like, ah, make this make sense to me. Do you feel like women, I, I would guess that that is a more of a woman trait than a male trait. Who knows? I know I've done it. Have you ever received an email from a man with five pages? Oh, you have. Yeah. Handwritten. So. <laughs> oh, I've gotten short little things, but never like that long burst of stuff. That in, my, in my younger years. Yeah. Yeah. I think it just depends on people's communication styles, but the writing, I don't know, for me, I, my thoughts are more clear when I'm writing. 
So it, it's helpful for me. And there is that feeling of like, I just want this person to fucking hear me. Because yeah, they've stonewalled, wanna... you know, they've stonewalled and yeah, the so reason... unhealthy and it's frustrating. The reason that's happening is because they were stonewalling. Yeah. And so that's fine. But my new response to stonewalling is going to be to remove myself and go hang out with people who don't want to stonewall. And if this person wants to ever come, this, this has happened to me more than once. Again, men are more likely to stonewall. And so, the, and if I'm anxious and pushing, then they're going to stonewall more. And so my new response is going to be like, ah, go see what else is going on today because you, I'm not going to play that game anymore. I think that's an important thing to acknowledge. I think it's healthy to say, uh, this isn't feeling healthy. You don't have to say you're doing this, but just say, this isn't feeling healthy for me. I'm going to remove myself from the situation that puts it all on you. Yeah. You are dominion over yourself and yeah. you can away yourself. You can even say your behavior is not healthy right now because you're not putting it on them, but certain people's behavior sometimes can be very toxic and unhealthy. Yeah, but they might not, if they are toxic, they're not going to hear that. You know what I mean? I feel like they probably won't hear that, but and that's where it doesn't matter because you are taking the control and removing yourself from the situation. Yeah, so you just say, you know what, this doesn't feel healthy to me. And I'm, I'm 86 and I know, but the problem Jeez. is so <laughs> we put a couple of quizzes down below. Here's the problem. Is that, uh, yeah. And information in general. And of course, subscribe. Subscribe to us. Follow us. Go follow us on Instagram. We're putting more stuff on Instagram. There's tell two all your friends, please. Tell all your friends to follow us. We're, we're fun and we are giving you all the information you need to be in a really healthy relationship someday if you're already in one to make it more healthy. At least we're trying to. We're trying. Yeah, I hope we're being successful. Also, I want more questions. Um, anybody who wants to email us with questions, comments, past past episodes, any questions you have, we'd like to answer them for you um, on, on our future um, episodes. But we did it. We did two quizzes. One was about um, uh, how you, how well you repair. And one of them was about your type of communication. Yes. And I essentially was a challenger, which means I like to, I believe arguments are healthy. I believe communication is healthy. I want to challenge people and have that communication go on. Yeah, I can get passionate about it. But I, to me, I also feel like it's a way to be closer. And because you're having those conversations and now you feel like you've cleared the basement out, clean out that basement. But on a negative side, sometimes people who are challengers, and I too have been guilty of this, can take it a little to the extreme and cause the nagging and the criticizing to happen. Um, on a positive side, um, it's passionate energy and, and it allows communication. Yeah. What was, what was yours? I was a negotiator, meaning that I like to say, Hey, you seem, you know, it seems like things are going a little askew here. Let's talk about it. Where are you coming from? This is where I'm coming from. How do you feel about all that? And uh, the negative of that, how that can be manipulated by somebody else, I suppose, is they can uh, stonewall the conversation or, or shut it down. Yes. But I try, I think at this point in my life, uh, I try to catch things in real time and not hold on to them for too long. I mean, I try and say, hey, I'm feeling this is happening. Is this happening? Or am I crazy? You know, mm -hmm. um, and that other quiz that is down below. Uh, which, what was the title? Oh, I just looked them up because I couldn't remember which one was which. The one we just discussed was what is your argument style? And I was the challenger and you were the negotiator. I'm the negotiator. The one is a love quiz on how well do you repair in your relationships? And since I'm not in a relationship, I took it as, as how I felt in past relationships. Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. so what, what was your response? I got 100%. <laughs> Can't be right, but that's what I got. No, it's, I mean, maybe 99 then, but because- Remember, if we always think we're right, then we, yeah, we're not going to be loving if we always think we're right. But see, I didn't, I didn't take it. That test was interesting. I didn't feel like it was saying, "Are you always right?" It was more, it was more about you're just your approach to yeah. talking things out. And I think that the score I got fit with that negotiator. It does very much so. And for me, as a challenger, it kind of made sense too because I was at ninety percent as far as how well do I repair in a relationship, which made me happy. I was like, okay, well. I feel like you let things go pretty fast. Once oh, I, let things, I let I let things go. I I I forgive and forget very fast, uh, which can be a detriment because people have also taken advantage of that. Uh, but I feel like yeah, okay. 
because once I have the data and I understand why and how, okay, let it go. Figure out how to do better next time. Yeah. yeah. And it's all a process. We're learning as we go. I am much better in relationship now, ironically, having no relationship, but I'm much better in relationship in general now than I was, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Obviously, we grow and we hopefully and we learn. One of the things I did that was really helpful was I sat down and I made a chart of my past relationships and I wrote their what I perceived to be their positive and negative traits and then what my positive and negative traits were within that relationship and I I charted how they were parallel and what was I learning what was I not learning what was I drawing to me in relationship what were my partners like what was I repeating partners in different bodies you know what I mean uh, and that was really uh, insightful so I recommend that if anyone's interested in trying that Super helpful. I did something similar, but didn't quite deep dive as much as you did, but I was looking for similarities in the people that I would pick based yeah. on attachment styles, love languages. And it, it is interesting to go back and kind of really re do those again in your head and learn from it all. Right. Yeah. And then if you really want to freak yourself out, you'd be like, Oh, mom, mom, mom uh -huh. dad, 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 mom, dad. But they remind you, know. you of a parent, like what? Yeah. But I mean, that's natural. Is that, isn't that the Oedipus complex from uh, Freud? Oedipus and Electra, it, but it's uh, it's really about it's really about an understanding that we seek out in relationship, at least in the beginning, uh, to repair to find the love that is missing from the absentee parent in our life. Yes. So, which is plays a lot into some of my past relationships when I looked back at it. Yeah. All of ours. Everybody Everyone. should deep dive a little bit into your past so that your future moving forward is amazing, whether you're in a relationship or not. The yeah. whole goal is to have a happy, healthy relationship, not just with a partner, but with friends, coworkers. And yourself. And yourself, most importantly. Yeah. So on that note, when we talk about ourselves, in two weeks, we're going to talk about fantasies. Ooh. So uh, all things having to do with fantasies, the good, the bad. There's not really bad fantasies, but you know, people can, people can call some of them less healthy, but I think all fantasies are good fantasies. As long as the unhealthy ones stay in the fantasy land and don't hurt anyone because ah. these are destructive and that's okay. As long as they stay in the realm of fantasy and not venture onto the real world. Yay. This is really fun. I'd love you. Thank you for uh, listening, watching everyone. Make sure to, like we said, subscribe. It's really helpful. Please spread the word, tell your friends about us and our, our, uh, you know, our fun that we're having trying to just untangle this world of relationship. It's a, it's a roller coaster, is it not? So join us and, and let us know what you're thinking and feeling and, and we're happy to answer any questions and Mara, I love you and thank you. This was fun. I love you mucho. We will see, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Be well, everyone stay connected. Be connected and well.